Hey there, I hope everybody is doing well. Shannon Dreyer here with the Mariners Insider Vodcast and Podcast. That is available too if you would rather carry it around on your phone as you go through your day doing the things in your house as you are staying home and helping everybody do the things that they need to keep everybody safe, healthy, and hopefully get us back to sports as soon as possible. We've got another great uh, podcast and podcast for you this week. Some interesting guests, some interesting conversations. I'm uh, really kind of finding the conversations are a little bit different right now. I think everybody is in the same boat. Everybody's at home. Everybody's a little bit bored, and so people are talking right now, which I, I guess uh, is a good thing. I'm learning things about guys that I didn't know and you know, guys that I have known for years on this team and talked to. So uh, I'm finding that end of the spectrum interesting. Of course, we'd rather be talking about games on the field, but we're doing what we can right now. Before we get into what is on this video, I want to remind people that uh, the Mariners and Bloodworks Northwest are teaming up for a pop-up blood drive at T-Mobile Park, and it's going to run for the next three weeks. There's information about this. I wrote a story about it on 710sports.com with all of the links. Uh, but what you need to know about it is, is they, of course, are following all the correct protocols uh, they are doing the social distancing. You must sign up for an appointment time. There are no drop-ins. You must be over 16 uh, to donate. But if you can help out in that regard, uh, that would go such a long way for uh, so many people in this community right now. And the Mariners are giving everybody who donates blood at this pop-up drive two free tickets to a future game. So there is that as well. Thank you so much to Mariners and Bloodworks Northwest for doing this and giving everybody an opportunity to get out there and to do some good if they can. Another thing, we're running the classic games every night at seven o'clock on the radio. I, I, some people just uh, didn't know that we ran the 95 games last week and they're like, wow, you should do more of this. We're doing them every night. Gary Hill has picked out all of the games, has a full schedule of games for as long as we need them and hopefully it's not too long. But coming up next week is going to be the 2000 playoff series. I know we always think of 2001, but they had a team that was on the up in 2000 and they did some damage as well. So tune in if that is something that you would like to hear uh, about. I believe on Sunday, one of my favorite games, the 2016 comeback in San Diego. Mariners down 12-2 heading into the sixth. They come back and win that game. Remember Deho Lee, the big home run. Remember James Paxton coming off of the DL. Just a terrible start and the Mariners bounce back. It was an absolute romp and a fun game to be at. Well, you can relive that on the radio on Sunday. In this vodcast, and I want to again remind you that it's available in podcast form as well, we have the full conversation with Mike Cameron. I did write up a part of that where he talked about what it was like to run around with Franklin Gutierrez and Ichiro in spring training and break down uh, the great Mariners outfielders of the past. We got his thoughts on that. He talked about that. Uh, and this he gets a little bit more into the up-and-coming young outfielders. We're talking the Kelnicks, the Julio Rodriguez's talks about his vengeance that he had against the Chicago White Sox and why some of his best games were against that team, and that includes the 2000 playoffs. Uh, also gets into a, a little bit his situation. He's at home, he's got a little one, an 11-year-old who made a brief appearance, or I guess an audio, you could hear her in the podcast. And so Cammy talks about a, a lot of different topics, including uh, how he's getting through these days right now without baseball. Our other guest is Braden Bishop, and uh, of all the players on the team, I'm not sure I could be more impressed with an individual. I, I think you probably know his story. His mom was diagnosed with Al Alzheimer's disease in uh, early onset Alzheimer's disease at that in 2014. And just watching him, the way that he has been able to balance that life and baseball and manage to do some good and help others has uh, blown me away. Uh, that is an extraordinary situation under the best of circumstances, and uh, he was able to balance everything and continues to do so, uh, even though she passed away, sadly, uh, this last offseason. What he is doing right now with the foundation is pretty amazing. It started as an idea, it started as a message, kind of evolved into wristbands and t-shirts and bracelets, and it's gone well beyond that. He's taken that to the next level, and... Uh, has a real chance to make a real impact in the fight against Alzheimer's disease. He's gonna talk quite a bit about uh, what he has learned with that, what he has learned about having a foundation, the direction that's going in. You're gonna hear some true passion in that conversation. And that conversation in particular just left me with the impression that uh, this guy's gonna succeed at whatever he does 
in life. So he'll talk about that. He'll also talk about his big league debut, remember, in Japan. He replaced Ichiro when Ichiro came out of the game for the final time. What a way to make your debut, right? He'll talk about that as well as a bunch of other different topics. And uh, up first, and before we get to that, I want to just let you know that we are talking sports all day long on 710 ESPN. I encourage you to listen on 710 on the radio or on the app, and it's uh, been a great distraction. I listen to them quite a bit anyway, listening to them quite a bit more. Got a lot of creative hosts with a lot of knowledge and a lot of stories, and a lot of that is coming out right now on the air. So give them a listen. If you're not, you should be. Uh, and with that, we are going to start out the podcast. Got my old friend, my off-season buddy, my buddy from the couch down in the beautiful studio that Taylor uh, built for us at uh, the it's on the shores of East Lake, 1820 East Lake, where our studios are. Um, can't go there right now, so we did it digitally. But uh, we start out the podcast with a conversation with Boy Howdy. 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 <laughs> Man, I mean, the last time I saw you, I thought for sure I'd see you in spring training. That didn't happen. We were in Taylor's beautiful studio downstairs with all the memorabilia. Now I'm not sure where you are, possibly the North Pole, from what I can tell. I'm just hanging but, out with my friend Chris here. He invited me over to his place. So, you know, That's awesome. I imagine there are a lot of toys. Um, yes. <laughs> yes, Probably there some are. good food and beverage, I would imagine. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know what? This is actually a little bit better than going to work. I'm I'm feeling this. Like I've got my own little cave in here that I'm working in. This is working out all right for me. I'm I'm imagining you're eating pretty well. Uh, yeah, I mean, probably pretty well as in like a lot of the things that I like. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, definitely doing that. <laughs> yes. Is your wife baking? Oh, man, she has been great. She's been trying to help me not consume everything that we have just out of boredom. Uh, but, yes, she's been baking, cooking like crazy, super helpful. Yes, it's been awesome. Have you been baking? You're the master baker. A little bit. I need to – you know, it's crazy because they're like no baseball. What are you going to do? Um, I've actually, it's, There's a ton that can be done right now. I've been doing a lot of videos, talking to folks, writing up uh, – stories, uh, putting together podcasts and podcasts. And, you know, my thing is, is that we know how to do this. I mean, baseball exists without baseball for half of the season. It's not quite the hot stove, but we can talk, we can debate, we can what if, we can, you know, there's history, there's things to be learned. Uh, we know how to survive without baseball with baseball, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Oh, yeah. The hot stove is everything to me. I mean, you know, based on our conversations for years, I love this idea of what could be and the team building aspect and how things are developing. Yeah, I'm all over that. So, yes, I'm right there with you. I'm excited to do this. So the baking has suffered. So you know, <laughs> there will be some. There has definitely been, and I highly recommend if you haven't done it, the Dutch oven bread. Have you done that? It's like a no-need bread that you do in a preheated Dutch oven. And it's just done at super high temperatures, and it's it, it's like an artisan loaf out of the yeah. oven. It's oh. amazing. Go ahead and okay. look that up. Yeah. There have been blondie brownies, of course. Um, oh. Now, this has truly been one of the worst parts of this quarantine for me. I can't have any of your blondie brownies. It's like one of my favorite things of the year. No oh. blondie brownies. Um, I'm going to make pierogi. I've never made pierogi from scratch before. I thought that looked like, you know... Got all the ingredients here. That looks like something fun to make. So uh, looking at different things and, you know, probably dive into the British baking show, the master class, pull something from that. I want to make pretzels. I've never made pretzels before. Wow. wow. If you may start making pretzels, you're going to have to open up your own shop. <laughs> Sell them out the front door. <laughs> so, yeah, there will be baking. There will be baseball. Maybe we'll combine the two at some point. Um, I, I kind of teased this last week, but I felt so bad for you. You had the most <sighs> spring training trip planned. Mm. You got down there and you are texting me and emailing me. And I don't think you really understood what was going on at, the, at that point. Well, maybe we'll just come by and see what's happening in the morning. <laughs> like, no, no. Tell us about your spring training yeah. plans and what happened. Yes. So some know I had never been to spring training before. Uh, so it's going to be my first trip trip uh, me and my dad were getting on a plane and as we're leaving we're hearing about things being shut down and as we're getting on the plane 
reading rumors on ESPN and on Twitter that spring training is about to be canceled. Games are about to be canceled. So while we're in the air on the way down to Phoenix, Arizona to watch Mariner spring training, during that time, they've canceled all the games <laughs> moving forward. And I had an idea that this was coming down. So I was just texting you hope upon hope asking like, maybe there is just a little bit going on, just like you catch a smidge of baseball somewhere, anywhere. But I mean, as, as you can recount from being down there, it was furious that day, just how quickly the news was updating and how like up to the minute they changed plans on games being canceled, games potentially being moved. Within an hour, there had been this, the idea that, yeah, we're going to play this game. No, we're going to play it somewhere else. And now it's canceled for good. So uh, yeah, my <laughs> first spring training trip resulted in zero baseball being watched. It was a pretty big bummer. And you were actually on Scott Service's calendar, too. Uh, there was a, a bet that was made. I don't even know how this came about, even though I was there for part of it. But uh, you were going to get on the field and face the skipper. Yeah. Yeah, I was so excited. In fact, I had gone to the Rage Cage up here in Linwood, uh, close to where I live. I got in. This is the first time I'd stepped in a batting cage in probably 11, 12 years. And wow. uh, I was just taking cuts. And by about the 30th, 40th pitch, I was, I was starting to square the ball up. I was taking it the opposite way with cons uh, consistency. So I felt really good about myself. Um, yeah, I brought my glove. I brought a different Mariners hat for every day I was planning to be there. I had five Mariners hats I was going to wear over that oh course gosh. of time. Oh, uh, it was, uh, and I was looking forward to it the most. I mean, I, I'd been looking forward to taking cuts off of Scott's service for a long time, but he joined Tom, Jake, Jake and Stacy recently and said the offer still stands and he wants to get me out there sometime. I'm happy to, I'm excited. I can't wait to show him up. It's going to be so, so beautiful for me. I, I'm, I'm very excited. Show so. him up. You're going to yes. show him up. Yes, I, I think am. he was just as disappointed as you were. He, I, I, <laughs> I told you, but he had me write it down on the big whiteboard where they have wow. all of you know everything that they're going through every day. He's like, "What day is Howdy coming?" Write it up on the board. You were actually <laughs> on the board wow. in his office. Growing up, it was a part of my dream to make it on a lineup card, and that's about as close as I've ever gotten. I made it onto some kind of major league lineup, so I feel pretty good about that. Well, we will get you there, no doubt about it. Before we get to the baseball stuff, I want to talk a little bit about what's uh, going on at 710 ESPN. I mean, obviously, I'm at my house. You're at your house. Uh, can you explain what you do at the station there on a normal basis? Yeah, so uh, the vast majority of what I do is audio editing. I'm the imaging director of sorts. So um, I'm putting together all the promos, all the stuff that you hear. As soon as they go to commercial break, I make that. Um, so any sort of montages that kind of play over time, the snapshots at the top of the hour with the news updates. I'm writing scripts for our voice guy, um, just doing a lot of that kind of stuff. So that's uh, my main responsibility, and I'm fully set up to be remote. Uh, so I'm super blessed to be able to have a job, continue to work, continue to contribute. Um, just help wherever I can. But everyone at the station is right now pretty much working from home. Uh, our entire operation on 710 ESPN Seattle is run with one board operator, a team of three engineers, and that's it. Those are the only people who are in the office on 710 ESPN Seattle. Everyone else is working remotely. Um, sales staff's working from home trying to work deals and uh, programming staff is at home trying to figure out ways to digitally broadcast like you and I are doing right here to do some extra stuff but um, everyone is at home and it's uh, it's been cool to see everyone rallying together and the different perspectives that everyone has to try and provide some to provide some hope some to provide some levity some to uh, just help inform uh, even more the serious nature of what's going on so um, yeah, it's cool to be a part of this team and what we're doing right now, I think, is is a cool thing for our community. It, it, you know, you need the sports for the escape, but I think there's been a great balance of there's also reality that we all have to face and be responsible for right now. And I think that, uh, you know, just flipping on the radio and, and hearing that I, I love the balance right now and, you know, the challenge of broadcasting from how many different places right now, just huge hat tip to the engineers and, and every and, and all the hosts that have had to turn into engineers of sorts at times <laughs> to get all of this to work. Even Jim has managed not to screw this up. Um, <laughs> I think, I think probably. But yeah, and then of course the board ops who are actually coming in too. 
um, just really amazing how we were able to transition so quickly. And I just went on um, Jake, Tom and Stacy, and you can tell it's like when you first come on a show and when everybody's in different places, there's a little bit of talking over people and, and trying to get that dynamic to work. That is smoothing out right now. It's just uh, just incredible endeavor that they have pulled off so that we can do this in the most safe fashion imaginable. And uh, I'm right there with you. Very proud of what the station is doing right now. Are you keeping yourself sane during this time? I mean, you're used to being on the road like crazy now. Like you should be starting to get in the swing of having to replace your, your luggage all the time now because it's getting so beat up. Like how are you holding up through all that? Yeah, I go through one suitcase a season. That's all it'll last because it's so well traveled and I did not replace last year's suitcase. So that'll have to be done as soon as uh, this gets going again. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't. Um, I, I actually do home pretty well. So I, I, I'm doing OK with that. But, yeah, you do get that itch. I should be on an airplane right now. I should be, um, you know, heading to it'd be great to head to Anaheim and have a, a morning to go to the beach right now. And then, of course, get to see baseball and and talk to these guys in person. So that part is a little bit tough. It's really helped. I've been talking with guys almost on a daily basis and uh, you'll see those, uh, well, obviously you're watching it or listening to it right now in the podcast and the vodcast, but we're going to do more of the stories. There's so much content. James, a lot of these guys are bored. They're in the same situation <laughs> that we're in right now. And they're really talking. There is no question <laughs> that they are talking right now. But um, I do appreciate them being generous with the abundance of time that they have right now and the willingness to talk. And I think it gives us an opportunity to connect with them, too, in a way that we never have before. And this was an interesting team on paper. It's an interesting team in person. And it's really interesting uh, getting to know them now in this situation as well. So a lot of content coming in that regard. But, yeah, I'd much rather do it with a new suitcase and hopping on a bus and, you know, heading to wherever we're heading and uh, finding the suitcase at the hotel and then going to the ballpark the next day. It's uh, we are all looking forward to that at some point. But I think, um, you know, one of the big questions right now is how far do you go? to get baseball back. How important is it to have the game? And we heard a, a very extreme scenario put out there a couple of days ago. What were your thoughts on Jeff Passan's report on what baseball could be planning? Yeah, so just to sum it up from what I understand, Jeff Passan's report is he'd heard from Major League Baseball personnel that the league has been in contact with federal health officials and gotten tentative approval for when they deem it safe enough um, to basically resume the Major League Baseball season with all teams playing games in Arizona, where I was supposed to be watching baseball just a month ago. Um, and they uh, they would play at all the different spring training facilities, including the Arizona Diamondbacks uh, home stadium, just there. And the, uh, the way this would go is that players wouldn't be able to sit next to each other on the bench. They'd have to sit six feet apart in the stands during the game as it was going, which was an interesting sort of way to think about that. I'd never even considered that before. Um, they're talking about having obviously no fans at these games um, and that these players would be in full isolation quarantine. They're either at the ballpark or they're at MLB sponsored hotels in their rooms with all delivery services to provide everything they need. But that's it. That's all they're allowed to use uh, in order to keep the baseball players safe. They'd all obviously be tested upon arrival to make sure that nobody, when they get there, has the coronavirus so that they can say we have a, re a quarantine group of healthy individuals and we're going to keep them this way. And so um, it's extreme. But I mean, personally, I think it's a little bit practical if the goal really is to keep people safe and to keep these players from being exposed this would technically be the way to do it it'd be difficult to police and i don't think the players would love this whole idea especially if this thing continues to go on as health officials um, have projected that this goes on until we find a vaccine and that could be nine months from now if, if we're talking about an entire baseball season played this way with these players all quarantined to one spot i'd it sounds like a hard time for them, but I personally would really love to watch baseball and I would love to have it played. So if this is what it takes, I'd be all in. You know, it's funny because every time I hear it, different things come to mind and some completely different things came to mind as you talked about it right there. When I first heard it, I'm like, well, May, that's ridiculous. But B, 
this is kind of what they were talking about all along. Like when baseball came back, it most likely would be without fans and it very well could be in one location. And then when you hear the whole biosphere or biodome or whatever they're talking about, it starts to sound crazy again. But when you were just talking and everything is under the umbrella of it's got to be deemed safe by the right people. Very, very smart people have got to make up their mind and and what we do. But two things came to mind. You were talking about, oh, all they could do is go between the hotel and the field. Isn't that what they're doing right now? I mean, they're all confined to their homes right now. That is no different. They are probably all getting delivery right now. The guys I've been talking to are not leaving their homes. The difference is they're with their families. Well, could you accommodate families in certain situations? If your wife's pregnant, can you bring her? If you've got little kids, you know, can you do that? I'm wondering why you wouldn't be able to do that. There's plenty of housing. There's lots of resorts. There's, you know, a lot down in that, that area. So, to me, how different is that to what they're doing? And my second thought on it is, is at some point, everything's going to have to get going again. We're not, I mean, it's not just baseball that's going to have to do this. It's any business mm-hmm. yeah. that yeah. gets going is going to, it's not going to be all of a sudden you wake up one day and everything's normal. Yeah. No, right. it, it's not. There's going to have to be additional testing. You are still going to have to social distance. You are going to have to jump through hurdles. Um, and it, in nine months is optimistic. I, I think it's going to be a lot longer than that. Although in the short term, I think you could see things like, you know, the antibody test, which is going to help a lot. Who has had this? And But we still need to learn what that means. You know? yeah. Are you truly yeah. immune? But yeah. I, I think, you know, a lot of things could happen in that time. But again, somebody is going to have to lead the way why not baseball if well you know what's exciting about baseball baseball has been looking and you and i've talked about this a lot on and off the air baseball has been scrapping and looking to get that edge back to become america's sport the thing that they held so proud for so long that this was america's pastime and we've all been a little reticent to say but we have to admit over time it's just not the case anymore it doesn't hold the national attention the same way it had when it was at its peak in popularity and compared to the other leagues the nfl and the nba have taken off in terms of national popularity if baseball is able to figure out a way to be the first entertainment element that's live and back and providing hope for the united states of america i think that this would be a huge huge aspect for them to be able to gain some sense of prominence that they've been clamoring for and they've been trying to scrape for so if they're able to do this i'm proud of them and i'm excited and interested to see how they're going to be able to try and push this forward and obviously i hope they do it safely and i hope they don't put anybody in jeopardy or at risk unnecessarily or um, beyond what the recommendations are from people who actually know what they're talking about but if they're able to do this, this is a huge, huge opportunity for baseball. And I think they're ready to seize it and they're anxious to do it. Yeah, I'm sure baseball sees it that way. I don't want that to be the motivation. Uh, you know, you want everything done right along every step. But what's to say that the CDC doesn't come out or, you know, another group and, and say that this is how we come back? You know, it, it could yeah. be the test balloon. And uh, I think that um, it's an interesting way to go. Obviously, you don't want it taxing any other area. And I think that that'll be one of the bigger challenges. Um, because we're not seeing a rapid increase on getting tests or things along those lines. And who knows what Arizona will be like a month from now. But um, I I do like that they are proactive and creative in in trying to figure this out. So if the opportunity presents itself, you know, be it June or July, then they're ready to go or to move forward. You know, obviously, this is page one of a huge book of many chapters, And, you know, getting it out there and now the players have been introduced to it, uh, a lot to be figured out um, that is within their control and then things that have to happen that are things that are outside of their control. Um, That brings up the interesting question. A lot of people ask me, is there a drop dead date for baseball? Hmm. And I don't think so, other than something that would be so obvious. They want to play. They want to play a lot of games. You know, you as a fan, what would be an acceptable season? For you, for me, I mean, any amount of games is good, but I think there's probably a certain amount of threshold where you can't look at it and say, 
clearly we understand who the best team is in baseball based on this number of games being played. I mean, the Mariners started off the season last year, like what, 18 and two, like they were ridiculous. Like you're going to play 25 games and have a team like the Mariners last year end up winning the world series like that. That doesn't make sense. So I think there has to be some measure of distance in games to me. I think 50 is probably close to the magic number to me. If you can get 50 games in, I'll feel pretty good that you've got a good chance to have the best team in baseball prove themselves over that time. Now, obviously, that's a third of the normal list distance of, of a season, but I still think you get a pretty good shot in 50 games to determine if somebody's really deserving. What about you? I... I'd be happy for any games. I don't even care about the legitimacy of the season at that point. There's going to be a big old asterisk, and rightfully so, next to it anyway. I just want games. I I don't even so much look at the competition. Of course, coming from the Mariners' side, it's all just experience anyway, right? (laughs) (laughs) That's right. I'm I'm so looking. I'm so thankful that this happened this year instead of like 2015 when they were like trying to scrape by, piecing together a roster with like average to middle contract veterans all over the place and their margin was just a razor thin to compete like can you imagine that being the season that the coronavirus ends up wiping out this one last shot that you had in these windows it'd be awful like for the mariners they're just trying to get this season to move their salary forward and get some young players some experience and time to get seasoned and so and let some of these other teams sort of throw their money away at veterans and let them get too old to be useful so yeah for the mariners this like not to be callous but this is about the best timing in their rebuild that this could possibly happen yeah well it's it's absolutely crazy to think of some teams that have free agents that they sign for one year and they're going to get absolutely you know next to nothing Mm -hmm. out of them and but it does hurt not to get that experience i mean that's another popular question well if they don't play this year do you move the timeline back (laughs) like they're not magically going to get better not playing so yes you move the timeline back well in some senses yes but also you do get the your salary situation moved forward one year so yeah you might not get the development of players maybe they only develop 20 percent as they would just because their bodies are naturally maturing and they're reaching more of their athletic primes and coordinations whatever all that stuff but if your salary situation is moved forward another year that gets you closer to the fiscal openness to be able to add some serious pieces to your roster so this is one of the final years where they're going to be paying dead money to players and then they move forward they're not paying dead money anymore they're now available to spend it on free agents right i mean their own players are getting more expensive but their expensive players the less they play are getting cheaper i hadn't thought of that you're right on that now figure that one out on your chart your payroll chart (laughs) (laughs) seriously i don't know how you work that out but i don't know how you work that out either but that is something uh that i hadn't thought about so Yeah, I mean, that's where it stands right now. We're in a holding pattern right now. Hey, what are some of the things, as I mentioned, I'm talking to a lot of guys. Anybody in particular you'd like to hear from? Any topics that you would like addressed? Anything fun that you can think of that I can put in an ask and possibly get? Man, I've loved hearing from, before this lockdown happened, I loved hearing from Julio Rodriguez, and I loved hearing from Jared Kelnick. I liked hearing from Logan Gilbert. I thought that that was just fun and entertaining the times we got to talk with them um i just really think that this young group of guys has a lot of energy you know there doesn't seem to be that many stiffs of like yeah this guy is just not that an interesting of a person not really interested in talking not real thinker he just kind of goes out and plays the game and does his thing they seem like they have a really solid young crop of guys who are curious and interested in trying to press forward and do things differently and gain every edge they can not taking things for granted so um Man, I don't even know if there's a specific name. I think I'd personally like to know a little bit more about George Kirby. Um, I know that we've gotten to speak to him a couple of times in different capacities, but um, there's a good chance that he's somebody that might be worth watching sooner than even we think he should be watched. Um, And then uh, another guy, Isaiah Campbell, is another guy that's sort of out there that we hear whispers about from different people. Um, So I think that's somebody that I'd like to get to know and, and hear about, but I'm just, I just think that this is an interesting group of people. I don't know what you think. Yeah, you know, you just inspired me. There was um, I did a lot of videos down in spring training, and there's one that I didn't video. I just did audio, and I should have videoed. It was um, a couple of these I had no idea what I was getting myself into when I sat down because it was a get-to-know-you, and I literally yeah. didn't know them. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> let's sit down and talk and see where it goes. There are a couple of those. Joey Gerber was kind of one of those. Yeah. And he... Um, 
he was probably going to be the surprise, I think, of camp. I think he had a hmm. very decent chance of making that roster when really? going in. Yeah. When no going into way. spring Yeah. Going into spring training, we thought, okay, the young guys, all the guys that did so well in, in double A last year, and we've heard so much about, um, we had a feeling that they were probably not going to start. They were going to let them kind of get their feet under them before bringing them up. And Gerber is the one, you heard a lot about Sam Delaplane, but Gerber is the one who really stood out in spring training and did not miss a step. And uh, I, I, he was fun to watch because, um, you know, he's got that goofy delivery that just makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> um, he is best friends with Logan Gilbert, and the two hung out, and they looked almost like twins, except Logan Gilbert's like 6'6", possibly taller, and Gerber is probably 6'4", and looks like he could be six inches shorter. But oh, he's wow. not. And, and they both kind of look alike, and they get confused. The fans would confuse the two for each other. And Gerber's a bit of a goofball, and uh, just getting his story and hearing how he came up with his delivery and he only had one college you know recruit him the university of illinois didn't think it was very good didn't even make like summer league teams and the story is hilarious um listens and believes that any music after 1989 is just garbage <laughs> it's new school and he hates it and he's okay. like Three, I think. Just a funny kid. I will play in the podcast. I will include that in the podcast, the conversation. And when I went and had him pulled out of the clubhouse, it was on one of the days after we were told we couldn't go into the clubhouse. Uh, he came out and he couldn't believe he was being interviewed. He said he hadn't done an interview since college. And he kept laughing in the middle of it. Wow. It's like, it's my first interview. I'm sorry. I'm like, hey, it's mine too. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of fun and that energy that you talk about. And I, I think that th this is a person that uh, people are going to like on and off the field as well. So I will include that in the awesome. podcast. Awesome. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to be a shill, but I think that there's a lot of like, you know, Mariners fans, they really connected with the nineties Mariners uh, for so many good reasons. But a lot of that was identifying with the personalities of that team. Cause they were here for a long time and yeah. they were great when they were here. If you want to be the true Seattle hipster right now, like go out and start to get to know some of the younger names who are on the cusp of becoming a major leaguer here in Seattle and start to get to know their personality and start to connect with that because you got a shot. If they do this thing right and they do end up realizing their potential, you got a shot to have that same kind of group where you've got guys who are here for eight to 10 years all being a part of this together coming up and you know you have a chance to fall in love with a group of mariners in a way that i don't know that we have since the 90s and that's something that they want you know that's part of the intention and uh, depoto's talked about that quite a bit in his efforts to lock up guys and it was really illustrated with all these old games that are on right now about a week ago they had randy johnson's no hitter which was in 1990 and i'm watching that game I'm like man randy looks totally different out there and he wasn't the randy johnson yet that we remember i mean he walked the world for three years i think he led the league two or three of the previous four years in walks he didn't have the long hair that you see flying when he just unleashes the fastball and the slider but and so you looked at him like yeah that's young randy johnson there jay buner steps up to the plate he's in a crouch i'd never seen that stance from wow. him before. and he had hair and, you know, you look at these guys, and that's where they were. And yeah. Edgar and Junior looked about the same. They were almost even, you know, in their first years in the big leagues, still, they were Edgar and Junior. And I'm not saying that there are three Hall of Famers in this group by any means, but fast forward to the 95 games that we've been watching the last few nights, yeah. and they're totally different. And, you know, they, they'd grown. They'd turned into what they were going to turn in, and that didn't happen in 95. A lot of it happened in 93, 94. And so, you know, these things can happen, especially if you have a group, and that's what they had back in the 90s. And they brought them up, and they were embraced. And I remember going to those games and watching those games, and you wanted to know who they were. And guys would have – you'd go to the Kingdom, and people would have signs, and they would all be for all their favorite players. And you don't see that as much anymore. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they really embraced. They were – our players and I can say that back then because I wasn't in the business I was just a fan at these games but you, yeah. you know you embrace them as your players so good good observation there all right howdy what's for dinner tonight I think we might be having a risotto I'm mm. pretty excited about it 
Nice. Uh, I'm pretty excited about it. It could be it could be a real good meal. And then we got Easter Sunday this upcoming week, which is going to be uh, a different deal since you can't really have the same kind of gathering that we always have had. But um, yeah, it's, it's going to be a, a nice experience, too. What about you? What's your dinner tonight? I'm going to do a crock pot kind of pulled barbecue chicken, and I'm going to do it on baked potatoes with a little sour cream and green onions. And then I'm going to uh, got to be healthier with the veggies. Do some spaghetti squash to go with that little parmesan, little yeah. butter on that. Yeah. Wow. This is a, it's like a Kansas City thing. Like you're missing your trips to see the Royals games or what? <laughs> yeah, maybe. I, would we be there right now? I don't know. We might be on our way there right now. We yeah. uh, we had an off day scheduled in Kansas City, and that probably oh. just added another year to my life because the plan <laughs> was we were going to try and hit three barbecue places in one day. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, right. No, oh, we absolutely could places do in it. one day. Oh, we could do it. No problem. No oh. problem. I would not be able to have the self restraint to like have try the first one and be like, you know what? I love this. I'm not going to keep eating it. There's yes. no chance. No, no, no chance. Long day. You stretch it out, you know. <laughs> but it's and it's not like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It'd be early lunch, yeah. lunch, lunch, dinner, dinner. snack. You yeah. know that. Okay. Kind of, Good. Good. Yeah. Well, barbecue places typically are closed by like six or so out there, right? No, 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 no. We get yeah. after barbecue there. Gates, they usually go to the gates after the games. I'm not a big fan of gate. It's okay. just sacrilege there. But yeah, the burnt ends is what they would usually go for after games there. But yeah, we'd be at Oklahoma Joe's, no question about it. Bunch okay. of places that are really good. My more healthy foray was the off day in San Francisco last year. Um, didn't Wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I decided I was going to investigate San Francisco avocado toast and try as many avocado toasts. Okay throughout San Francisco that I could. And I went to four different places and had four different avocado toasts. Well, the great thing about avocado toast is you could try 15 different places and you'll still be hungry. So <laughs> much healthier than the barbecue. <laughs> Good so, stuff. Yeah. I'm going to have to maybe do like an around the world with avocado toast at my own place right now. <laughs> and in the kitchen, we have this on the back porch. We have this. Nice. nice. Yeah. I'm in. You can eat it and I'll watch. I'm not going to eat it. You can you can do that. No, okay. That's the only way it's going to work right yeah. now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Abney, thank you for joining us. We'll do this again. <laughs> Thanks, Shannon. All right. Well, Braden's got his coffee. He's ready to go. Doing one of these in the early morning. A little different lighting. I love you've got the best backdrop so far, Braden. Good work there on that. <laughs> so you're at home in Sacramento right now. Yep, yep. We uh, decided to come up here. It's just I don't, like being around family during this time. I felt was important. Uh, just so much uncertainty. I feel like family's pretty certain. So that's why we came up here. That is a good way to go. You're staying home. You're staying safe. Yeah, trying to. Yeah, I mean, getting a little stir crazy, but love pretty much everything I need at the house. I'm I'm an introvert, so I put everything at the house. I don't have to leave often, um, so it works out in this situation. Other than family, what are the most important things to have around you? For me, a bat, something to hit into, and uh, uh, something just like a workout area. Mm -hmm. Luckily, like maybe a year ago, put in like a nice home gym because whether it was like an off day in the off season or something i always like to like keep moving and just like keep working out so being locked in the house uh, or confined to the house it you know works out um and then also trying to make sure like you know especially with the virus going around trying to do things that are gonna help my immune like my immune system so Making sure I got my supplements, fruits and vegetables, stuff like that, which is hard to get when you can't go out. Mm. We talked to Mitch about this about a week ago. He had a very elaborate plan. He's on top of everything as well. He's got to be one of the most kind of in tune guys. And you had the opportunity, unfortunately, I think, to spend a lot of time with him last year. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, we spent too much time together. That's for sure. But he's, yeah, he's one of the best at it, just at known his body and i think being through what he's been through you know it kind of probably forced his mind to, to go there and what's going to make him and get him in the best shape he can be because i mean he's had some bad luck yeah, without question and I, I always like to ask you how's the spleen <laughs> 
yeah, I mean, it's good. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, I still kind of, I was talking to Mike Ferrari a couple days ago about it and just like, you know, physically I'm fine, but it's still like mental and uh, like, it's hard to describe just like how the rhythm, like when that happened, I don't know, it, like scientifically, I'm not really exactly sure how to explain it, but just like getting the flow back of life and playing baseball again and it's been tough like it's definitely been a big hurdle and challenge and just trying to figure out like how to get through it because just like you know what we my family dealt with with alzheimer's like there's no instruction manual on how to rupture your spleen and come back and play you know mm -hmm. in the major league so trying to figure it out has been the hardest part for sure who are the people that you talk to when you need to figure these things out? Well, I'm super lucky. When I went to University of Washington, um, there was a like a church group we had, and there was a pastor up there, and he's like at the time he's like late twenties. So, uh, you know, we got along super well, had a bunch of stuff in common. So he's kind of like a perspective I use. Um, my wife, obviously. Um, and then, you know, I have a couple friends from college who, you know, I talk to often, um, one's an investment banker in Seattle, uh, who grew up like 10 minutes from me. So just like having guys who like knew me mm -hmm. and know what makes me tick and kind of like understand how I work. So when I do come to them with something, they know kind of what direction to steer me because obviously it's hard to fix somebody, but they kind of push me in the right direction. That's fantastic. It's good to have that circle uh, of people that that you trust and that can help. You mentioned hitting a second ago. We talked with Tim Laker yesterday, and it was funny because I thought that maybe the bigger challenges would be with pitchers, but it sounds like it's really tough to hit. Yeah. On your own. A lot of guys haven't been able to do much of anything. For sure, yeah. I think it's just such a unique time and like everybody has their own experience and you know it's tough when you don't know like are we gonna play at all or are we gonna play in june like are we gonna, you know and so trying to like piece together and i think we're all wired like we want to be ready like that you hear it all the time like i want to be ready i gotta stay ready um but with like the uncertainty you just try and get any work in you can and i don't think you know, whether you have a full setup with machines and somebody to throw to you, you know, whether it's your dad or your brother or whoever, to guys who are, like, hitting wiffle balls with, like, a skinny stick or something. Mm -hmm. you know, I think it's just about being creative and, you know, kind of feeding the hand-eye coordination because, you know, at this point we're kind of all in the same boat. I would say most guys don't have, like, full setups with machines and right. I used to throw to them and you know nobody's obviously facing pitching right now so mm -hmm. everybody's in the same boat but it is tough but I think if instead of like worrying yourself like oh, I'm not getting the right work or I'm not getting enough I think it's just like how do you view the situation you know how do you use, how do you use perspective to fuel the performance rather than you know like actually fueling it through what we're so used to right you could learn something, you know, some stumble upon something that perhaps works that you otherwise never would have known. For sure. I talked with Mike Cameron yesterday, and he said he was going to get his son out in the backyard with a, a stick and bottle caps. I mean, he's got other ways to do things right now, but, I mean, that's how they used to teach that, you know. He thought that's a good way to get kind of the velocity of the hand-eye and really quickly. It's a good replication. I mean, heck, players like Edgar did that a long time ago. For sure, yeah. I have, like, a – it's like a little – machine and it shoots out wiffle balls like super fast mm. so i kind of treat that like i'll put it at like a close distance and yep. then i'll treat that kind of like my velo machine or whatever because i don't have one <laughs> probably shouldn't either that'd be a lot <laughs> exactly neighbors might not like it either there'd be baseballs everywhere <laughs> Hey, uh, we saw on social media yesterday, and it was just a great reminder of what we were all doing a year ago. And, you know, just an incredible trip to Japan. It was your big league debut, and 
You've got to have one of the most memorable debuts of anybody in the history of the game. Yeah, I know. It's it's weird to think about. You don't. I don't think people believe me when I tell the story. Like if they didn't actually like see it or hear it from somebody, and I tell them like, okay, like that's funny. Like that that'd be an awesome debut. I'm like, no, it really was. <laughs> but yeah, it was. I mean, every time you think back on it, it doesn't seem real to to me even. And you know, you you always like. You know, forever I dreamed about making my debut, and I pictured it happening. You know, and you know when I got drafted by the Mariners, I pictured it happening at T-Mobile. You know, I pictured it happening in front of Mariners fans. You know, or you know, in a, a ballpark in the United States. And then, yeah, I remember in two thousand, the end of two thousand eighteen was when the it came out. Or no, when what? whatever it came out that the Mariners were going to go to Japan and play the A's. I remember thinking in my mind, like, I have to find a way to get on that. Like I'll be getting towards the point where like, I'll be close to making a debut if all goes well. Yeah. And then I remember coming into that spring training and it was like just on my mind, like I have to get that, that 26 or seven spot. Like I just, and then Malik's got hurt that like right at the beginning and I just like I was like I have to like this is an opportunity I have to try and do everything I can like that's in my power and my control to try and make this happen and then I somehow snuck on there so we had an incredible spring there's no question about that and then you step in for Ichiro of all people when did you know that you were going to be the guy that was going to go in and take his place in the game uh, I'm I'm happy that we played those exhibition games against the Tokyo team because uh, then I kind of got a picture of like okay, like I'm the that fourth or fifth outfielder, so mm-hmm. I'll go in for each hero. So I mean, obviously, I wasn't sure like when the actual game started if that was the plan, but just like you know, kind of feeling the flow, especially like coming off the bench, like you want to try and feel the flow of like. You know, what the manager's thinking, right. you know, the, the game showing, just so you can, like, stay ready. So, like, those two exhibition games kind of gave me, like, a example of, like, what I could kind of prepare for. But I don't know if you could ever be ready for that. And then uh, that first game, uh, he had told me, like, hey, each might come out at, like, this point. I don't exactly remember what the sub was in the first game, but it wasn't me. So then I got to sit on it for another night. And then finally that last game, which I knew was going to be emotional because, I mean, like I said, like I tweeted about it yesterday, he hadn't announced it, but you could kind of feel it just like with the emotions and, you know, how he was kind of like, you could tell he was taking everything in a little more than probably usual and like how like hyper-focused he is. Um, and then as the game went on, and then they told me, and I think it was like the fifth inning, they told me, hey, he's going to take one more at bat, and then you're going in. So I think it would have been like in the sixth I would go in. And then uh, I want to say, and you remember, like everybody was so like wound up as his at-bats were like unfolding because you want him to get a hit so bad because you, you know <laughs> like the, the last one's coming. Right. And I think uh, he, he made an out. And then he came back in, and I could see him say something to Scott. And he was like, I think he was saying, like, hey, I want another. Like, give me one more. So, obviously, you know, I'm going to understand. So, they come to me and say, like, hey, he's going to take another. Like, we're sorry. Like, And yeah. I'm like, don't say sorry to me. Like, <laughs> I'm so, um, so, yeah, so then he took another. And then I think I went in seventh or eighth. And then... And then I think we played like 11 or 10 or 11 that night and got in that bat, bat, still don't remember it. So, but don't tell me what I did. (laughs) What do you remember about everything that happened once the game ended? That was one of the most, not probably the most amazing thing I've seen in sports. Yeah, that was, it's hard to describe that to people too. Like, no, I'm serious. It's like a movie, like how that happened and just how it unfolded and like I've never I mean I've been to hundreds of sporting events in my life and I have stayed to the end for most of them and like 
I would say within 15 minutes, like stadiums are empty. Right. For it to be like 45 to an hour later, and there's still like 35,000 people in there, you know, all for him is just crazy. But it shows like how, what a figure he is over there. So what was it like to come to spring training this year and have not only Ichiro, but Mike Cameron and Franklin Gutierrez all running around out there? Just three absolutely first-class outfielders. For sure, yeah. And I think the coolest part for us was, you know, a lot of guys, you know, whether they were new or it's their second year with us, they might have just known Ichi for a little bit, like as a non-roster guy or first time meeting each, like everybody is pretty much everybody's first time meeting Goody, which I got lucky when his last year with us was, I was, uh, I would like back up. So like, I kind of interacted with him a little bit Mm -hmm. and then Cam, obviously he knows pretty much all of us, but you like see how good of people they are. Mm-hmm. And like how they carry themselves and when they show up to the field and now they're coaches but they still have this like mentality of like you know I want to get better and I want to help you guys and and I think with like guys like that who have so much experience they want to help share that experience and like what they learn from each experience and I feel like you know right now especially in baseball when you have all this knowledge coming from guys who never really played the game Mm -hmm. like they have like unreal knowledge and like they're great teachers and Mm -hmm. we have a lot of them like guys who have helped change my career change a lot of guys career but then you have like the other side where you have like cam goody ichi you know guys who have played in the big leagues for a short or long period of time so they have these like experiences like hey i went through that like, this is how I got through it, or this is what I did. So then you have, like, you kind of have a direction that you can go to try and, you know, navigate that experience because they kind of shed that light for you. And especially with, like, how young a group we are, like, not many guys have experience. So <laughs> you use guys like that as a resource to give you tools. So when you get through it, it's not like – because, I mean – like example i was like when i went to japan you know i had seager had just got hurt he had just hurt his hand so he wasn't going but he told me about the last time they went and like hey this is what you can kind of expect like look for this you know this is like what the game's like over there like do these things during the exhibitions to try and like and so just like my point is like he gave me these experiences that he went through so at least I kind of had a somewhat idea of what I was getting myself into. Mm-hmm. Now that's what like those like Goody, Ichi, um, and Cam, like they've been doing that for us, you know, for the last like year mm-hmm. and even longer. Um, so like that's what makes it so special to have guys like that around us. Yeah, it's, it's great to see them and great to see the knowledge and the communication that they're able to share with you guys. Hey, I want to talk a little bit about um, your foundation. It, it's just to see how you have grabbed it and, and ran with it and, and just taken just an unimaginable situation and, and taken it into something where you can do good with this for a long time. Give us a little update on where the foundation is and, and, and what you see for it right now and how you got there. And Just yeah. tell us a little bit about what's going on with 4Mom. Yeah, I mean, it's been a absolute journey, you know, from the actual circumstance of why it started, you know, and going through that, and then at the same time advocating for a cause that's not talked about enough, that needs more advocates. So, you know, we've built something that we feel is sustainable now, something that we can kind of like keep pushing to the next level we went it's just crazy to kind of see where it when you have an idea which was 2014 for me uh, and then you just like basically you know stay persistent and you know keep trying to 
push a really heavy ball up a steep hill, um, which, you know, I think like charity in general, you have like these super small uh, campaigns or charities or foundations and you're fighting really big causes. And so for us, like at first for me, it was just like, I want to raise awareness because like my family's going through it. We're struggling this is where we're struggling. This is how we're struggling. Kind of like the experience, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm trying to share our experience. So if people are just starting to go through it or are going through it. We might be able to provide some answers. And then I realized I've done a lot of research, um, you know, in the philanthropy world and, you know, what are the best charities doing? You know, how are they kind of like pushing the ball forward? Are they kind of forcing the issue are they cold calling fundraising like what does it look like and for us you know i don't i don't like that like cold call fundraise like mm -hmm. i'd much rather create a relationship and have people feel like they're included in like our mission and cause and if they want to help you know that's when they would step in and do that mm -hmm. but then at the same time you know, I view it kind of, I view it differently. Like if you're in big business, like your goal is to produce and then you make money and then you use the money what to either produce more or, you know, use it however you want. But in charity, for some reason, it's frowned upon to make money. But in order to um, reach more people and have a, you know, cast your hand on a bigger region, you you need money. And in order to, to cure something like Alzheimer's, which is going to take a miracle, you need money. And it takes fundraising, it takes big events. Um, and that's kind of like where we've kind of like switched our strategy a little bit, where it's like, now we want to try and start to press the issue where like our events are bigger and we're kind of stepping out and being a little vulnerable and uncomfortable and how we, um, you know, do, do our events and, uh, like this. So basically I'll get a feeling, um, that it's happened this way the whole time we've had for mom, but I'll get a feeling of like, Hey, I want to do this. And then I'll slowly start to, brainstorm and strategize like okay how can I make that happen mm -hmm. so you know at first it's like I just want to have these small events and then it'll be you know I want to create a um a t-shirt line and I want to just sell as many as I can like I want I want to send them to guys I want them to post about it whatever you know and then next thing you know we get seven thousand dollars in a month from it and then so I'm just like creatively strategizing and then this last year um I, it just like came out of my mind, like, I want to have a conference. Like, I want to have an educational conference for caregivers and doctors and nutritionists, strength and conditioning, movement specialists, uh, you know, Chinese medicine, whatever. So, you know, I call our director and I was like, I want to do this. Like, how can we make this happen? So we put together a package. Next thing you know, January 23rd 2021 we're having uh, care for mom our first conference in san francisco uh which is a saturday and it's basically like a whole day thing we have maria shriver's coming um robin williams wife is coming he passed away from louis body dementia so they're kind of in the middle of it you know basically offering a service to families who are going through what mine did and we had no answers so like hopefully we can kind of provide those uh, answers but it's not it's free to everybody who wants to come uh so that's one two uh it came to me like hey i want to do a i want to do a tour like i want to go around the country and i want to <laughs> share our story uh i want to film it and then at the same time like we need to make a documentary like we need people to know so like through the past year we've been planning out this documentary you know like feature my big part on my mom and like who she was before because mm -hmm. i always tell people she was this certain way you love her 
and then you have to say goodbye to that and then you learn to love this new person and like care for this new person and then you got to say goodbye to them so it's almost like this double-edged sword where you, you're saying goodbye to two people that you learn to love so we want to share that story obviously my brother and my story you know coming through and building this and then we're going to go on this tour uh, through Dallas, Washington, D.C., New York City, Phoenix, San Francisco. And there's like Alzheimer's walks in each city. So we'll do the walk with a team in that city and then have like a small event. So it'll be from, you know, a chef donating his restaurant for the night with like a limited, you know, number of people. Uh, just like small auction, small small events and then when we're in dc we'll we're going to talk to some congress uh people uh, about just trying to push some different legislation forward um to try and just get the word out a little bit more and then the conference will be in january um and then we're gonna debut the trailer for the documentary and then hopefully netflix and amazon prime and hulu will pick it up after that but we'll see but exciting stuff you know just constantly thinking but it's just crazy when you have like a thought and then you have like a persistent action and then all of a sudden you see you know now we have like five team members and my mm -hmm. brother's more involved and we're going on tour and, uh you know sharing the story on platforms like netflix and stuff it's just like i wouldn't have pictured that in 2014 at all wow that's, that's amazing. I mean, from T-shirts and bracelets to everything that you're doing right now, which is awareness and huge awareness, which is, uh, you know, first step in the battle. That's that's huge. Congratulations on all of that, Brayden. That's fantastic. Um, one small fundraiser I think you could do. Haircuts. Yeah, I could. I got to figure out how to work that one in. You're the barber. Yeah. How did that happen? Yeah, I, uh, my freshman year in college, I, uh, well, so I was, so my freshman year in college was 2012. And I, uh, like, I don't think at that time haircuts were very prevalent in baseball, <laughs> at least from what our team, I can remember. And I was getting tired of looking, and I had like, got my hair cut pretty religiously through high school uh, my best friend's stepdad was a a barber in uh the bay area and that was like the first time i had been exposed to like the culture of a barber shop and just like you know the barber's chairs are kind of whatever you know all around or against the wall and like the conversation you know you just hear like organic conversation you know, guys who like care about their sports teams, you know, the game last night, you know, whatever the gossip was, you know, just like barbershop talk. And so I was like, I loved being in there. So like every Sunday in high school, he would offer free haircuts for, you know, the guys on the football team, baseball guys, whatever, as long as you like stayed out of trouble and like handle your business in the classroom. And then I went to school I found a couple of barbershops in Seattle. Uh, Supreme Cuts was one of them. I was in the university district. Um, that's what I went to in college. And my freshman year, I got hurt uh, like the last week of the year, so I couldn't play summer ball. And I went back to the barbershop, and I was like, hey, can you teach me how to cut hair? Like, my team has the worst hair. Like, I need, I need a help. And I, like, always loved the look of – you know, a fade or whatever. So he taught me that summer and then I bought a kit and then I cut one guy's hair on the team and it was like pretty good. Like it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like what it is like today, but uh -huh. it was good. And guys were like, Oh, where'd you get that? Cause obviously you don't have a ton of time to like go to a barber shop. So I started cutting everybody. And then next thing you know, like a football player found out, cut his hair. That was the most nervous I've ever been to cut hair. And then I just slowly started cutting more people. I went to Cape Cod that next summer, started cutting guys on that team. So then, like, word got out to other colleges that, like, oh, you know, that we had a guy on the team who cut hair. And then I got drafted, went to Everett, 
And I was like, I'm not going to say anything. Like, I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> and then and then my roommate asked me to cut his hair, I cut it. And then next thing you know, it just, every team is the same. I was like, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to be that guy. And then next thing you know, you know, whether it's a guy I played with or a guy who heard, and then I cut his hair. And the next thing you know, uh-huh. every, every time we were in the clubhouse, I was cutting hair. Got to the big league, same thing. <laughs> Is there anyone in the big leagues you've been nervous about cutting their hair? Um, so I would say, you know, I feel pretty comfortable. Like I've been doing it for almost like six years now. So okay. kind of like. You're a pro. Uh, yeah, I feel like with, <laughs> I mean, like with barbering, you, it's like, I mean, it's very creative. Like it's, an, I mean, pretty much artistic ability. So like you can mess up a little bit and like still. Yeah. way and like make it work like no one would ever know mm-hmm. and now like I know that and I'm like oh my god every time I get my hair cut like he probably messes up and like doesn't say anything because he just fixes it like it's not bad um, but I would say uh, D asked me to not even like cut his hair really he just want to like clean up the edges and I was like super nervous like, I can't mess this up because uh, he has a <laughs> barber he brings around uh, uh-huh. So that one, and obviously, like, guys who are on TV consistently, like, don't want to mess them up. I don't want to be the, fault. Yeah, I don't want to be the guy who, like, you know, gets tagged on Twitter, like, wow, look at shit there, <laughs> jacked up, or look at JPs, but, oh. so, but I think everybody's serious, so. Yeah. You know who I'm really worried about right now through this whole situation? Who? Goldsmith. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See his hair bad or what? Well, I mean, there's nothing he can do right now. And, you know, he, he's a TV guy, so he, he takes care of that quite a bit. For sure. And I've heard it's gotten very elaborate. And, really? And to keep it all on top of his head. Wow. So, yeah. I mean, you might check in on him at some point and just maybe <laughs> offer some tips. I don't think he's going to do anything on his own. But, uh, yeah, Goldsmith, I think, might not be in a good way. Yeah. And the other one, Divish, probably. I think he gets his cut every exactly three and a half weeks, and uh-huh. that's just out right now. And, you know, we got some, some people on the other side, too, to worry about right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a I, – uh, I had to teach my teach my wife how to cut my <laughs> hair. So I had, like, mirrors everywhere. And I was like, okay, <laughs> you're going to go, like, this high with this guard. Uh-huh. I would like look at every mirror and be like, okay. And that's like three and a half hours later. It actually <laughs> it actually looked pretty good. I mean, I basically took her step by step and I was sweating the whole time, but we made it work. You got to do what you got to do. <laughs> Use your resources. Hey, before I let you go, just... Um, are there any? Is there anything on Netflix you've watched? Any games you've played? Any books you've read? Podcasts you've listened? Something you've cooked uh, in quarantine life that you can recommend to others right now? Um, let's see. Anything I've watched? I'm big. Uh, I'm big into. There's actually a show on Hulu uh, called Extreme Rescues, mm-hmm. and it's like super extreme rescues like you know people like fall down a cliff uh-huh the helicopter's gotta come in but it tells it from the point of view of the rescuers mm-hmm. so it's just, like, super fascinating to see like that line of work and you know how they approach like life or death situations um that's a cool one um i haven't watched tiger king uh, like everybody has uh let's see something i cooked uh i did uh the other day i did uh like a i made like a homemade like cashew cream like garlic cream pasta sauce so that was wow good. yeah so you like soak, vegan? yeah soak the cashews for like an hour and then you put like <laughs> garlic lemon juice uh in a blender uh-huh water and mix it up and then you have the pasta ready yeah so that was that was interesting and then no, wait, wait wait is that interesting good or interesting 
<laughs> it was both. Like, obviously, it's a different consistency. Like, okay. it's a little more coarse because the the cashews, but right. It was pretty good. Like the garlic, obviously, saved the day. <laughs> um, um, and then I've been super into. I mean, I'm kind of like Hanny, where I'm just like into wellness in general. So mm-hmm. I usually pick uh, one thing per week, and then I'll like go deep dive and like research it. And ah, okay. Like one week it was it was charity, and I wanted to, that was like when I first like was like I need to view it more as like business if I want to like reach more people. Mm-hmm. So like TED Talks. Um, there's a good one on like how to view charity as like why it's not bad to view it as business. Mm -hmm. And then I did another one on like, um, it's, I mean, it's like, um, like, so like lion's mane mushrooms, uh, chaga mushrooms, reishi mushrooms, and like their connection to, they put them in like coffee and like tea now. Uh huh. Um, and it like the correlation to like immune system and how it helps boost immunity, mental clarity. And then I like try to find like the crossover between brain health and these certain things. So there's a guy named Max Lugaver, and he has a podcast, uh, mm-hmm. the Genius Life podcast. And his mom had Alzheimer's, and now he's like a full blown. Uh, nut on like brain health and like mm-hmm. how different things and so he talked about this was the first time I heard it was like how these uh, certain uh, mushrooms that they put in teas and coffee or you can just like eat them in your breakfast or whatever that or they sell the powders or, like sprouts and like how they help you boost your mental clarity and like your it reduces aging by the plaque that's on your brain that causes cognitive diseases Mm -hmm. like one one thing a week and so like that's my most recent and then I'll try and like cross it over to what we're doing and how we're trying to affect people try and get a little smarter through this whole thing wow you uh you've got a plan yeah Yeah, I try (laughs) Braden thank you so much for taking the time I think everybody really appreciates hearing from you guys right now And uh, stay safe. I hope we see you soon in person. Yeah, me too. Thanks for having me, Shannon. Well, that's the beauty of baseball. You know, it's we're used to this. We spend a whole offseason talking about it. You know, we'd rather have the games on the field right now. But, you know, baseball is about stories and debate and discussion when you can't play it. So we're doing that right now. And who better to do that with than Mike Cameron? Here's a (laughs) bit of joy because that's what you do. And Mike... You know, we go back to those last days of spring training, and um, I could tell you were really going out of your way to try and keep things light. You were the one who was kind of popping in on some of the press conferences and checking in on guys and, and, and smiling and really, uh, you know, as I said, trying to keep things light. Yeah, it's just, just you know, we're just in some kind of like unfortunate, um, uh, concerning times right now that we are just overwhelmed with not not being in control of anything so um you know each day we still get a chance to get up and hopefully you know that everyone stays safe safe and healthy uh, enough to be able to ride this out god knows when and um get a chance to get back into the place we love on a diamond on the baseball field you know get a chance to get in the grass and everything else i'm sure if nothing else, you know, we get through this thing, the appreciation level for uh, everything that we've been given is definitely going to be at an all-time high. Oh, I think there's no question about that. Do you think about the first thing you want to do when you can get out there? Uh, yeah, you know, like, the only thing I've been doing is, like, going to the grocery store. That's about it. And so it's been difficult. When you have a 11-year-old um, that is constantly, constantly ragging you down to go somewhere. And it's just like, we cannot go anywhere. So, um, if anything, just, uh, getting a chance, uh, I, I you know, I get, I, we still get a chance to go outside and, and play, you know, I play catch with my kid in the yard a couple of days. 
uh, whenever he decides to come over here. But for the most part, um, just everything that you always want to do, like the, the the freedom to be able to roam again a little bit will be much more enjoyable. I hear you on that. Hey, let's take it back to spring training this year. I um, think it was just one of the most awesome sights that we could look up on a field and see you running around, see Ichiro running around, see Franklin Gutierrez running around. I'm like, well, shoot, that that outfield could give anybody a run for their money. Yeah, probably, probably, <laughs> probably uh, in an old softball game right now. But, <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, it's kind of, you know, kind of cool. I think, you know, each row had a chance to overlap with both of us. So, um, you know, to share the experience, I actually caught him um, in his early part of his career in Seattle and Franklin. I think he kind of overlapped him in the middle uh, of uh, of his career and everything. So um, to, to be able to get a chance to share those experiences back out there again, um, I think I had just missed Junior because I had to come home because my kid was having um, – um, labrum surgery or whatever so going through that process and so that would have been kind of like really really unique to have you know really the last four long-standing members of Seattle's center field scenario. <laughs> <laughs> uh, go ahead and call them great center fielders how would you break down all four of you as center fielders what was this what was similar and what was different? Well um, you know, I guess, you know, each row be more of a right fielder than anything. I think his, his, his area is over there is very secure, but if, if that's the case and we have to make it all four, um, we all just had like unique presence. I think Junior just had this, um, electricity as far as how he went about, um, uh, scaling walls and everything else and and uh just the, the the energy that he provided for the great northwest for so long even from the age of 19 you know when i was 19 years old i was in like uh extended spring i think so um to to to, to be able to kind of have a guy to like look up to and everything and um i mean he was just special in his own right arguably the best player uh in the game at especially at the time that when I was considered to come uh, to be able to, to come to Seattle and everything. And I guess, you know, Franklin just, you know, I was still playing while he was playing. So just to get a chance to see him play a little bit, I think he was just uh, really smooth. I think the game transitioned a little bit where, you know, like we, I, we were challenged to try to challenge the play as short as possible, but the game kind of transcended a little bit. Now everyone plays deep because everybody's trying to go deep. Um, mm-hmm. So uh goody was i guess he was known in seattle as death to flying all things and um that's that's a bad nickname right there to have you know as an outfielder or whatever so uh you know and myself i you know like it was just that i was just athletic enough to do all different types of things um and i used uh the stadium to my advantage as much as possible um I could always jump. I could jump really high. So I use that to my advantage playing in Seattle. Um, I used to practice this stuff, and people used to think I was crazy, you know, the sliding catches and jumping over the wall. Uh, I did it from early on uh, with Joe Nasik back in, even before him, it was uh, uh, Gary Pettis and uh, those guys. We used to practice this all the time, especially when I got to the big leagues. I didn't play my first few years, so. Um, the padded walls helped out a lot and to be able to jump into those walls and everything, just kind of learn how to do that a whole lot better. And I, obviously Ichiro is like, I just call him, he's like a, a, a dancing, a dancing ballerina that's fully suited in a baseball uniform. I mean, he's, he's like the, the, uh, this, this, the, the black cat, man. Like the dude was so silky. He was soft. His feet were soft. He was light on his feet. Um, he could do everything, and but he never showed any emotion. So um, that was just kind of something that you know, we would always try to draw out of him all the time. So uh, just pure greatness in a sense as far as um, each of us had our own little era, just so to speak. And, um, you know, we, and I think like Jay Buhner is the only other guy to want to go glove in the outfield in Seattle. So you know, it's pretty unique to be a part of that group. That's a great group. 
No question. You talked about practicing some of the improbable plays, and I, I know it wasn't quite the same, but it seems like there was a little bit more of that with the outfielders this spring where they were actually taking balls off the bat. Ichiro was hitting them quite a bit, and maybe yeah. more than we've seen before. Yeah, because the machine doesn't really, you know, gives you the, the, the true feel of what it's like to have a guy like Ichiro. First and foremost, for him to do that uh, and do a whole practice, probably about 15, 20 minutes or whatever, that's pretty impressive to hit the ball exactly where uh, Scott Service wanted him to hit the ball. Uh, it's just impressive in itself. Is it that? Yes, it is. What are you doing? I'm, on, I'm doing something on, on TV. <laughs> um, there it is. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yes, uh, it, you know, like each row was like we – we we talked about it a lot going into the off season as we as we had the meetings and stuff like that and guys being able to actually um, brainstorming and how we go about it and really the best way to get better in the outfield is obviously someone standing at a plate and hitting balls so you can get a true read and you have to go after it like it's a game you don't have to do the whole batting practice but at least mm-hmm. five or ten minutes where you can actually get a feel for what's going on. Did you see improvement or things that they might not have done when they were able to do that? Uh, especially, you know, you know, I, I'm just because I was signaled to really help Ma- uh, Malix, um, the improvement that he did. Um, I mean, I guess you can attribute a lot of that to uh, Chris Prieto, um, that and, and the fact that Malix, he works hard every mm-hmm. single day. Uh, we just got to get him to put some shoes on sometimes, man. Jesus. He blames Ichiro I mean, for that. Yeah, Ichiro didn't go out on the field without shoes on, though. I mean, I can could, I could see if he wants to blame him for that, but he, Ichiro didn't go out on the field without shoes on. He might but want to tell him. We've been telling him the whole time, the whole spring. Is like He wants to hit barefoot. I'm like, bro, you don't hit no. barefoot in the game. Why are you practicing this stuff? <laughs> oh, I just want to stay connected to the ground. Like, okay, do that when you go home. Uh, but anyway, you know, like Malice, uh, you know, like I guess, you know, one of the kind of the lights as far as um, what I've been able to, to contribute to him and some of the other things that other guys, you know, especially Chris, you know, get a chance to see them over the course of a, um, uh, over the summer. Uh, the, the improvement has just been tremendous. He's actually starting to put some of the things together. Um, and I think that leading up to this year, I, I think, you know, me working with some of the younger guys and uh, Cal, um, Hosey a little bit, didn't see a whole lot of Hosey last year because he was just coming back. You know, I saw him a little bit. Uh, Kellenick, uh, Fraley, uh, let's see whom else uh, we had. Uh, those that were in big league camp, those are the guys that I got a chance to work with a lot, especially in double A. I got a chance to work with those guys a lot. Cause I went there a lot because that was where the most talent was. And, uh, it was kind of special to be able to get a chance to, uh, share some ideas, contribute some thoughts to those guys, because they're going to ask you why the majority of the time when you ask them to try to do something. Were you guys like that? I'm hearing that's kind of more the new generation right now. They really want the wise behind everything. Yes, that was one of the first things that I learned from um, from Andy, Andy McKay, and uh, and Jerry. You know, Jerry Depoto telling me that they're going to ask why, and you're going to have to have an answer. Um, and it's just just the way it is now. And so I've always kind of had you know some information to back up whatever I was asking of them. Most of the time, I didn't ask them to do something that I couldn't do or you know, I, I just kind of like suggested certain things because every individual is his own. Um, you know, we had a big debate about how to start, you know, in the outfield. I played a lot with my hands on my knees because I felt like I was more powerful connected into the ground. Early on, I didn't do that. But I found out that I didn't lose any steps by having my hands on the knees. It also saved my back a lot, you know, just from just standing around out there a lot of times. It was just kind of like my safe haven and my start, and some guys can do it however they choose to do it. What are you getting out of the coaching? How are you enjoying this? Uh, it's cool. It's been a really good experience for me. Um, learning, um, you know, I've just I've asked a lot of questions. Um, 
along with the information that I knowledge that I already kind of experienced the ups and downs, um, you know, being, I guess, you know, being here, you know, at, at this point, being as a, uh, a part of staff as a mariner makes it really easy for me because, you know, there's just a lot of information to go back and look at and back it up and everything, you know, so uh, it just makes me feel a lot better about, um, I guess, my place uh, with the ball club um, and to be able to go out now and be able to help some young guys, you know, with the experience, you know, just just to see some of the same things that coaches saw in me, you know, like to see Kellenick and I just see him and I'm like, man, he's, he's, he kind of reminds me of like either a left-handed Ryan Braun and, you know, or a greater size more type of guy if you really want to look at it, that type of player. Um, you know, and seeing J-Rod, he swears he can play center field. I'm like, dude, there's no chance you're going to play center. You're going to be too big. <laughs> Literally, just go to the corner, save your legs, and just hit bombs and do what you do. I mean, but he's actually getting better. But he wants to work at it a whole lot, which I would, you know, I wouldn't deny him that chance right now. But at the time, I think it's just better. Yeah, I told him, I said, your future is going to be on the corner. So uh, he's no, I could play center field. I got faster this all season. I'm like, bro, you you're, you're still growing. Like you're still like he's like That's a insane. he's like a big dunk right now. But, uh, you know, just, you know, and, you know, not only those are just the top guys, but it's like some other guys really that are raw and, and being able to chance to get a chance to give them some tidbits some some different experiences. And obviously, you know, everyone is going to tell them different information. It may transcend the same way, but, you know, Goody has the, you know, has a the ability because he of the, I guess it's, it's the Latin guys because, He's so he's bilingual. You know, I understand it more. He's more bilingual. So and that is going to be his, you know, first go around. So uh, it's kind of cool to be able to chance to uh, share some different thoughts and everything and, and the different experiences that we've experienced. Obviously, Griff is in a whole other stratosphere by himself because, you know, it's kind of hard to coach what this guy was doing because it was just so natural to him. You know, there's a technique to certain things. And I'm sure that, you know, a lot of guys can can kind of get some information on those things also he's in charge of the hugs yeah yeah <laughs> pretty much pretty much yeah. hey <laughs> we just uh came past the anniversary of the catch against Derek Jeter and I will never forget that because you know you look back at that club in 2000 and you were the young guy you know I mean yeah. not only were you you coming over and Ken Griffey Jr. had been traded, but you were the young guy, too. And you were, I, I remember, just um, in awe after that moment. And, and that, you know, hey, I'm playing in this spot, and I just made this catch. And I just got embraced by an entire ballpark of people. What do you remember about that day? Uh, I mean, it was just special in a sense because we, we started out, you know, what a way to start, you know, my, my career out playing against, you know, Boston Red Sox the first series and then turn around, you know, and then play the Yankees or whatever. And it's just like, oh, my God. And uh, 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 it, it, I felt like that play, uh, which I've been doing for, you know, for the first few years anyway, just that play in Seattle kind of allowed me to, just have a sigh or or a moment of relief of saying that, okay, the people can now can understand that, hey, we don't have Griffey out here, but this kid seems to be pretty good at what he does, you know, that he does this um, out here for us. And and I took that to heart. Um, it was like, I guess it was like a, my, uh, my warming, um, Everything for me, you know, that allowed me to sleep better at nights after mm -hmm. being traded. Because if I got traded like two weeks before spring training. Mm -hmm. if any, and maybe, yeah, two, even February 9th, I think it was, or something like that. So, you know, it was literally two weeks before spring training. I was a nervous wreck for the whole time, I, even though I was going to play baseball. But the fact that uh, the, magn the magnitude of it, because I got traded with King Griffey Jr., so the, sp the spotlight wasn't on Brent Tomko or any of uh, all those guys or whatever. It was, you know, myself, you know, and I, I mean, I don't know how many trades have been like that, but, 
you know, it kind of vaulted me right in the spotlight. Arguably, I say again, the the best player in the in, in the game of baseball at that time. I'm not going to argue with you on that one. What do you remember about that 2000 team? Uh, 2000. Um, the the thing about it is it was a kind of a, a veteran molded team with some younger pieces coming in. And uh, I just knew that, you know, with John Olerud still there, Edgar Martinez, Alex Rodriguez, um, uh, Jay Buhner, um, and I think, like, you know, McLemore had played against him for a while, you know, in the, in different settings. And, uh, and then getting Ricky Henderson, um, it was just kind of like, Everything for me, you know, having like a lot of older veteran players that I had already kind of played with veterans players, you know, didn't really play a whole lot. But coming up with them in Chicago and then went to Cincinnati, where it was just all youth. I mean, we were just young and with a couple of veteran guys and Greg Vaughn and Barry Larkin and Hal Morris. And I don't want to forget anybody. Hal Morris, P. Harnish, you know, it was like from the pitching staff, you know, just kind of remembering those guys. But um, 2000, I, I felt like it was kind of easy for me. I just – all I had to do was just kind of do my part. Like I, like I knew I could play the outfield like that. It was just that, you know, uh, offensively everything was kind of like starting to come together like it's supposed to for me. Mm-hmm. And um, I just felt like I added a dimension to the team. And the better I played – the better our team was going to be. And uh, and it kind of, sh- you know, I feel like it kind of showed uh, over the course of the team. I, you know, did the dynamic of having what Junior did, I just said, look, I probably am not going to hit 40 homers out in this place out here or whatever, but I can run, uh, I can hit homers, and I can do a lot of other things on the, on the field that probably he wouldn't be able to do as great as I did, you know, at that particular point in my career part point in my career so um it's just it was kind of easy having Stan Javier you know just another you know veteran guys man it was just so it was so easy the transition was easy as far as people wise I've always been a people's person I've always kind of connected in every clubhouse I've always been into and um and then having a guy like Lou having confidence in me uh was probably one of the best thing because look the one image I only had of Lou Pinella and I remember playing on the Chicago White Sox and coming to Seattle and seeing him kick everything all over and killing everybody. But that was my biggest fear of him cussing me out or just kind of getting on me all the time. Uh, but, you know, he 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 took me under his wing and was like, you, you're going to be fine. We're going to show you how to do this. You know, you're going to be fine. You know, he's an ex-hitting coach. You know, he played for the Yankees and everything else. And I, I, I just felt comfortable because I had some of these guys that were – uh, really good around me or whatever. So it just allowed me to just kind of develop my game even more so. Did Lou do that from the start with you? Oh, yeah, because he called me the day the, the day I got traded. I was so nervous. I was so, so nervous. I can't even, I mean, I can't even tell you how nervous I was because, you know, I've got my bags packed. I'm about to go to, to arbitration down in Sarasota, Florida and or stop in Tampa and then go to Sarasota, Florida. And everything changed because my whole world was flipped up side down baseball wise you know two weeks spring training i haven't been to arizona only place i had been was like tucson and that was for you know that's what we had uh spring training there with the white Sox, and and so it was just so crazy it was so so crazy for me and he made it really easy um pat gillett made it really easy for me but because not only now they just say hey we're not gonna just we're not gonna just you know we're going to give you the arbitration. I didn't go into arbitration. They just gave me a three-year deal. And I was like, man, this is pretty mm-hmm. cool. And uh, from that point on, you know, everything was kind of like like really special for me in Seattle from that day. You know, just knowing that if I play really well, that there was a chance that, uh, you know, like I don't know how many years it had been. Since, well, it's been a few years since they had been to the playoffs or whatever, but I knew that, you know, we had a good enough team to make the playoffs. And, I, you know, I understood what it was like uh, just coming from a team that kind of lost in a one-game playoff, you know, to the New York Mets. I kind of understood what it's like to play winning baseball. Playing with Barry Lock and Greg Vaughn was like one of my biggest mentors in that department and teaching guys, teaching us how to win, you know, especially at a young age out over in, in uh, Cincinnati. So, I mean, I was just kind of like really uh, excited about, 
the opportunity of being in the Northwest. But I mean, it was like, when I first got there, it was just kind of crazy. Shannon, it was so crazy because it rained every day. I didn't see that part. I never been to Seattle when it was like that. I only came to Seattle when it was beautiful, like in July, August or whatever. And just to go there and just like didn't have a place to stay. You know, I got young babies. I got a family. Uh, just sh everything shifted, but it transcended baseball wise. You know, being in a new stadium just kind of transcended, transcended for me in a way that, you know, I can't even I can't even be other than just grateful. You know, so much gratitude. Uh, to be a, to play in the great Northwest and to be remembered, a small town guy from Georgia, and uh, kind of a kind of a pearly shining star out in, in the great Northwest. No oh, man, man. Well, people obviously love you out here. There's no question about it. Yeah. That 2000 team, the ALDS, you guys just rolled. What was that like going into Chicago and playing those games at Safeco Field? And it's just like, yeah, we're 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 going right now. Uh, yeah. So my little story about Chicago is that fact that, you know, they traded me um, while I was in for a great, great player, you know, at the time, you know, we were, I guess I was one year older than maybe Paul Konerko, but he was a great, great player for them in, in Chicago. But I felt like uh, I was traded a little bit too early because I suffered like a sophomore slump or whatever after just finishing fifth in the rookie of the year. And and um, and so I got traded when I was in winter ball. They sent me to winter ball. I went to Dominican and I got traded while I was in Dominican and no one ever called me. No one ever told me anything. I don't know what the what the quote unquote uh, way to do it. <laughs> but I just didn't. I didn't understand. I saw my name on an off day. I was folding clothes up in my room and saw my name scroll across the bottom of a ticker saying I just got traded to Cincinnati. And I was just like, what? And still, you know, I didn't hear anything from anybody. And I just, wow. I remember tucking, wow. it, tucking that in my little back pocket and remembering that, that any time that I played against the White Sox, it was going to be some type of hell I was going to give them every single time. And I would, didn't matter, you know, and I want to make sure because they felt like, you know, I guess they didn't think I was ready to play over there. Someone that they thought was better. And I just said that there's no one you're going to get here that's going to play like I can play over here. So that was always a, a big inspiration to me. And to get a chance to play against them in the playoffs, like, and knowing what, you know, what I already kind of had tucked in my back pocket was like the joy that I don't think no one could take that away from me or whatever. And that was a really, really, really good team they had in 2000, you know, with, you know, Canerco, Maglio, um, Carlos Lee, I think, and you know some of those other guys, and to be able to go against them. But you know, that still has friends over there. It was, it was still, you know, it was business on the field. But obviously, you know, it was, it, it was. I had a lot of friends, especially you know James Ball and those guys. So um, yeah, it just goes, it goes really deep when we start talking about that in the White Sox or whatever. And to be able to knock them off, you know, to sweep them, a team of that caliber, offensively, offensively, and we had a um, a pretty good pitching staff, and to be able to kind of shut them down the way we did was uh, pretty spectacular. And getting a chance to uh, see Ricky score the winning run, and the way we did it was on a squeeze bunt, you know, just one of Lou, Lou Pinella's little tidbits that he does in some of the craziest games. And the fact that he came out on the field when I was at first base in the middle of a game, he called timeout to come to first base. Didn't relay the message to the first base coach or from the dugout. Came out on the field to tell me, just go ahead and run, man. You know, like, they're not going to pitch the egg right now. And sure enough, you know, he told me what to do. And, you know, he was watching the catcher. And in, in a light that I wasn't watching the catcher, I was watching the pitcher. And he just told me a little bit of information about that. And, you know, I stole the base and they could hit a bomb. And, you know, it just kind of like, man, everything just kind of came into place. Uh, for that series in particular, uh, to finish it off at home, uh, to actually be able to share the same energy and sentiment that the people share with me in my second series uh, of that catch and to be able to share the, some of the champagne on top of the dugout with those guys. Uh, it was a uh, pretty special, pretty, pretty, pretty special moment. Let's jump ahead to 2001, and I think 2000 helped kick it into 2001, and there, of course, were 
all sorts of very notable additions made, but all of a sudden Seattle's a baseball town again, and they were in 95, and it didn't fall off that much, but you're seeing every single night Safeco completely full. What was it like going to work each day? Uh, from June of 2000 on, that's all I knew, you know, like, because the people were coming, because we were in the hunt, hunt, like we were hunting people down uh, in 2000. So going into, and then being able to, you know, we felt like we we didn't have enough firepower going into the 2000 series with the, the New York Yankees. Um, so to lose to those guys, I think like four games or two or whatever that, you know, we kind of, we lost Alex, Alex Rodriguez. It's like, how in the heck you lost Alex Rodriguez and King of Virginia in, in, in consecutive years. Uh, and, and I guess if you want to add another year before that, you're talking about losing Randy Johnson and to be able to, to still be in the, in the fight, um, uh, in 2001, we just we knew we were a good team, you know. Like you, you sometimes you make it to the ALCS and everything just kind of falls apart, or you make it to the World Series and everything just kind of falls apart. Um, Pat Gillett was uh, instrumental in regrouping that that um, uh, the roster and putting more younger guys with some more veteran guys, guys that that could kind of blend in and make the team a lot better. And um, you know, having Lou at the at the helm, you know, like this guy was a, a real field general. I mean, he was a real field ge- general because of the respect that he commanded and that everyone gave him. And to be able to share that with him um, on the field uh, is is pretty special. And and then in two thousand one, every just kind of everything just kind of transcended. You know, we got Booney, uh, we got a couple of other pieces. I think. Um, we got a couple of pitchers with the bullpen shirt up. I think each row came. No one knew what he was going to do. All I knew was the, what I saw on videos of him. You know, I didn't know much about each row before the end. I just knew he was a really good player and how he was going to do it. But, you know, having him and, and uh, Sasaki for a second year is like, man, we, we you know, having Arthur Rose and Jeff Nelson, we were in a pretty good good place pitching wise, you know, to really close out games. Uh, offensively, we were still putting things together, but man, did we know what each row was going to do. And when he showed up, he just set the tone right out the gate. I think we, we started out 20 and five or 20 and six or something like that. Mm-hmm. Maybe mm-hmm. like two consecutive months. And we just, we played very well together. We made really minimal mistakes. Um, we hit as a unit. Like, we did a lot of little things that, you know, you don't normally see to do. We had everything. You know, we, we just had everything rolling. And um, and we didn't beat ourselves a whole lot. So we were tough. We were tough, especially from the seventh inning on. We were very tough to beat, even if we were down, because we did things, little things so well. And we just had, like, this guy, you know, like the – you know, exclam- exclamation point in each row because the unknown of what he could do, you know, on a daily basis. And it just made us ride whatever he was doing, you know, from that point on. You know, it's funny. You look at that team and I look at, you know, 2000, you ran into pitching in New York. That obviously was something that was really tough. And you look at the Mariners in 2001 and everything they did, they had good pitching, but was there an individual that was really great? You look at these days where you've got to have two aces if you want to go yeah. all the way and whatnot. Yeah. You had yeah. very good pitchers, but, yeah. yeah. I mean, Freddie yeah. did a lot for that team. Jamie did a lot for that team. Yeah. Um, we had good pitching. We we didn't have, like, dominant starting pitching, you know, mm-hmm. so to speak. Um, and we didn't have a lot of guys that threw, like, hard throwers. Right. Uh, um, especially in the starting pitching department. Uh, so we had to go through the gauntlet in the playoffs because Cleveland was about as good as the Yankees. Um, mm-hmm. We didn't have the pitching, but offensively, that team they had over there, Jesus. I mean, they, they were loaded also. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, that just, you know, the 2001 was just kind of a, 
a mere admiration of uh, a lot of things uh, of greatness and a lot of sa- a lot of joy and and sadness, and then to be able to to be a part of it because you know we kind of got shut down by 9-11 or whatever, but we dominated the Yankees during the regular season, but you don't face the fourth and fifth guy in the playoffs. Yeah. Um, you're going to see the number one starter twice and the number two starter twice. And all of their guys were like number one starters. So, you know, with Messina, Roger Clemens, Andy Pettit, um, El Duque, I mean, uh, it they, they were tough. They were really tough to beat. And they, they're they so seasoned at that part of the year because of the veterans that they had. I mean, they li- literally had a major league all-star team uh, year in and year out uh, in those early 2000s or whatever. So they were you, they were going to be like trying to beat Jordan. You know, you got to beat them like four out of seven times. It's going to be really tough to do. Um, so, and then baseball, it can go either way. It's just a lot of it is, I think, is that day starting pitching is what uh, your what your um, uh, your your uh, a, not a what am I looking for? What word am I looking for? Not motivation, but that day your uh, advantage, your advantage, your your yeah. advantage day. So I mean, yeah. it, it was it was a uh, pretty interesting, and we knew that. Uh, we were going to have to go through New York because, you know, we played well against them over the course of the year, but they were dominating everybody else. Um, and so we knew that at the end of the year um, that trying to get to the World Series is probably going to have to go through New York to get to it, to beat those guys. And, you know, it was just so uh, kind of a – it was a hard – that was a hard – that's probably the hardest – loss to bounce back from of the the ALCS because we just didn't play well at all, you know, going into that series or whatever. We just kind of got ran over. Um, mm-hmm. and it just, it wasn't, it wasn't that we were, um, that beatable. We just, we didn't play well, you know, for some reason. I don't, I mean, we can say 9-11 had an impact on it, but it had an impact on everyone. But the fact that I think that, you know, uh, I won't say the baseball guys, but, you know, in New York at the time or whatever. But, you know, I just kind of looked at a couple games that, uh, of it, uh, I think, on YouTube or whatever. Just like, man, what happened? You know, we didn't play. We didn't play well. And we just got out pitched. We got dominated in the pitching department. Mm-hmm. Um, Roger Clemens killed us, I think, at home. He set the tone for that team over there or whatever. But, um, yeah, it was a fight. It was a fight. And, and I think that we had such a tough time beating Cleveland. That took a lot out of us. It kind of mm-hmm. took a lot of steam out of us to, to just get no one, no matter, you know, like obviously we won 116 games, but obviously there's a second season. And that, that, that series we had against Cleveland was tough. I mean, it, we came out to the last couple of innings to beat them to get, get to the Yankees or whatever. So uh, I think it was, it was really tough. And I think maybe Jamie Moore, you got hurt or something. In between, no, it wasn't. I don't think he did. I think he was back. I just that I don't think he was the same. You know, just a little different. There's a lot of different going on as far as an ankle play. or something yeah, like that. There was something, yeah, there was something going on. You know, yeah. I mean, he was good. He was good. Jamie was good. Um, we just you need like at that time you need that kind of the, the, those power arms. And Lou loved the power arms, and mm-hmm. he didn't really have enough of them. He he said we needed another left-handed bat. And um, rightfully so, you know, the guy knew what he was talking about, especially looking and building a ball club that compete against those guys. What about, and, and I think, um, you know, a lot of people are talking about this, that it, after the tragedy of 9-11, baseball is what helped bring everything back to normal. And I think people are looking to baseball helping out here as well. What do you, obviously this is, you know, there's so much going on right now and going much longer and more uncertainty at this point. But what do you remember about being a part of bringing back the normalcy in 2001 with baseball? Well, for one, Shannon, uh, it's just a different 
scenario, I guess, you know, to isolate. I, mean, I guess for a, a week or two, we were just shocked and stunned in 2001 and, mm-hmm. you know, the things that took place. You know, this is kind of like invisible <laughs> and it has neutralized everything around us to the point that we can't even move the way we want to move. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, the travel case was it was the travel that was kind of neutralized back in 2001 because we were stuck in Anaheim. And uh, it was just more, I guess, a more of a fearful thing and, and what could happen next. This has kind of been building for a while, and we've been talking about it for a while also. Um, but baseball in 2001, you know, considering, you know, we had a chance to, to invigorate some energy back into people's lives that they enjoy, kind of the normalcy of the game itself to give people, you know, the the, the ups and downs, the, the the joy, to being able to roar, to be able to, you know, smile with joy, um, to participate in something like that. You knew that you could bring some type of energy. This situation right here has just been kind of like, man, just day to day. You just don't know what was going to transpire. You know, obviously, we knew in 2001 we had a once we had everything kind of lined up and back in place, we knew what the objective was. You know, now we 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 don't we don't know. We just don't know about what's really taking place, and that's um, I guess I you know, try to be optimistic about it. And, you know, hopefully we get a chance to get everything calmed down. But um, the, I think that when it does, like I said before, the the the, uh, the appreciation of all things will be so much greater, you know, from dealing with a situation like this. And considering, you know, Seattle was uh, hit very hard early on with, with the onset of this uh uh, COVID-19 or whatever. And, and, um, and obviously we get a chance to be able to, um, learn a lot, I guess, in a sense, but also really appreciate what we get a chance to do, uh, especially just going out on the grass on the baseball field. Absolutely. Looking forward to the baseball field. I don't think we ever take that truly for granted. Yeah. Is there anything that you've been able to? I know it's hard to be home and, and, and be cooped up, but is there anything you're doing now that you wouldn't have had the opportunity to do before? Are, are you finding ways to spend your time and learning any new things or along those lines? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, just, you know, being home, uh, I've got a chance to do a lot of stuff that in the, you know, like yard work that I normally wouldn't do. Um, <laughs> I've been Can't looking yard for, work? <laughs> yeah, like I, you know, I grew up in the country, so, you know, like everybody, I, people pass by the house is like, you're cutting grass on a push lawnmower. I'm like, it's no. exercise. Yeah. <laughs> like I put, I got my son's push lawnmower and I started cutting grass and everybody's like, why are you cutting grass? I'm like, why not? You know, I've been planting flowers. I've been doing everything, you know, kind of like literally doing because I live with a real I live, I live with a hypochondriac. So she don't even want the people to come in, like cut the grass over here and, and everything or whatever. So, you know, people that normally come or whatever. So uh, I wash cars that some of the things I used to do when I was younger made me appreciate it so much more now. Um, just um, I think the pool wasn't quite ready. So it had like a lot of green green slime in the pool so i spent like a three or four days getting the pool right because this little girl of mine is going to wear me out oh, so God. and then then we you know kind of like in the process of downsizing also so it kind of gave me a chance to come home and give me a chance to come home and actually uh put a plan together and um you know we were planning on putting the house in the market and uh mm-hmm. then everything kind of like came about and so we had to kind of shut that down for uh, the time being because you can't have people coming in and out of your house um uh, so uh it's gave me a chance to kind of like really um get a chance to do things that i normally don't do or just kind of like overlooked i've looked in the garage trying to straighten the garage out got no chance of that because there's just so much stuff out in the garage uh, i've been painting you know so a um, little bit of everything, you know. So uh, it's been, uh, I guess, uh, 
kind of melancholy, you know, because, you know, we, we, I turn the TV on and there's no sports, you know, there's nothing, there's no sports at all. And then I would be thinking about, man, it's Wednesday the 8th. It's probably the opening day for the minor league guys too. So, um, you know, just so much, there's just so much to be thankful for right at the moment and just kind of keeping everybody safe because, you know, for the longest time we thought that this was kind of a, a, a impact, uh, to our elderly community or whatever, but uh, mm-hmm. as we've seen, it just this kind of this had an impact on everyone. And you don't you don't underlying issues or not, you don't know how your body's going to respond. So the best way to do it is try to be as safe as possible, and uh, you know keeping yourself. You know I live with two people that has asthma, so I can you know I cannot run the risk. You know I think I've they they want to send me out in a hazmat suit to go to the grocery store. So. <laughs> So just 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 to kind of keep everything safe. But like I said before, I live with a hypochondriac. So um, it's just kind of like it's it's scary, but at the same time, you know, we still got to live. And uh, just to see the things that are going on around the world is is uh, kind of make you think. And it's just so crazy how you know something like this can shut down everything so quickly because you know we kind of overcame a lot of other situations beforehand and. Uh, this one, we we haven't been able to overcome it yet. Um, obviously, I know we will, but you know, at this moment right now, you know, there's a lot of uh, optimism about what's really taking place. Well, it is good to hear you are doing all the right things right now. Um, you know, staying home, staying safe. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 hard. I mean, it's easy. I'm I'm not like a, you know, I, I like to go. Um, uh, I like to go, but I don't really do a whole lot. Today we were going to go to the mountains, you know, up in the Blue Ridge Mountains or whatever, but the parks are closed there. So uh, just to ride around, you know, but it's like two hours away. So, you know, just kind of finding things to do, uh, whether it be here, you know, or whatever. You know, my other two kids, they ain't doing nothing. I mean, you got to get them outside. At least the sun's out. You know, not, it's not out right now, but it's been – really beautiful weather and so we've actually seen a lot of people together you know uh on a daily basis and exercise be able to exercise a little bit so it's kind of cool to be able to do that you know how's the weather up in the northwest area last couple of days it's been absolutely beautiful but we're still coming out of it it's you know you'll still have some cold nights or wake up and it feels like winter again so you know what April's like. Yeah, that, that <laughs> drizzle rain, that drizzle rain drove me crazy. I like, oh my God, I ain't gonna make it here. I'm not gonna make it. <laughs> it it's just so hard. It's so hard. But it it, it gives a um uh hopefully the air lightens up there and you know, like the mm-hmm. the, the trees and everything else is just I mean, I, I've always said the best place you wanna spend a summer is like in Seattle, man. It's so clean, the air is so pure. Uh, the greenery there is just, I mean, it's, a, it's just captivating, beautiful, beautiful. I'm glad my my people, ha- my family have got a chance to experience it there. And um, I'm going to be always forever grateful for the great Northwest. Well, we're going to get you back here for some baseball games sometime soon. No doubt about it. Mike, I can't thank you enough for just coming on. Uh, people miss baseball. They love the stories. They love knowing what everybody's up to. Really appreciate it. Definitely, Shannon. Anytime. Always, always. You take care, my friend. All right.